something we don't like to think about. People don't seem to trust scientists. I invite you to consider why this might be while I read a brief passage. While an explanation based on surface conductivity is a priori plausible, we present evidence that the effect is a bulk optical origin, specifically that the effect is a result of aqueous dielectric objects displaying morphologically dependent resonances, MDRs, at microwave frequencies. This opens paragraph 2 of a physics paper explaining why halved grapes spark in the microwave. It's got Latin in it. A common sentiment you'll hear on occasion from conspiracy-adjacent groups online is that scientists are insular and elitist, conspiring against or at least indifferent to the wishes of the common population. When we're asking them to read through material like that to answer the very popular and interesting question, why do grapes do that in the microwave? It's easy to see where this comes from. This is a very simple experiment anyone with a spare microwave and a grape can perform and yet you have to be at a college reading level to understand why it works. The question of grapes in the microwave could have been an excellent point of entry for the curious to discover something about the world, but they're instead met with a string of jargon you aren't taught about until your second or third year of physics undergrad. Sure, it's maybe not so big a deal when the paper's about an interesting quirk of microwaves, but what about when the topic is global warming? Or vaccines? or people are trying to learn about the latest treatment options for a family member's illness, or their own? Is it fair to write in language that turns them away from the primary source of knowledge, when that knowledge could have tangible, lifelong repercussions? People like this need answers, and if science does not provide them, there are plenty of interests out there looking to take advantage of them for either monetary or political ends. There is a reason people will listen to the conspiracy theorists before scientists, and it's because they make their answers to questions about the world accessible, easy to understand, and supportive of people's previously held beliefs. Now, they have the advantage of just being able to make things up, but that means it's our job to make the truth that much more available to disprove them. If we want to cultivate a trust between science and the public, and reach out to the people who don't know who to listen to, then we have to acknowledge that every person in a STEM field needs to not only know how to do good science, but know how to be an effective science communicator. Now to be fair, there are several good reasons why scientific papers are written the way that they are. The major one is accuracy. Science is only science if its results are repeatable. And if you want to be able to repeat an experiment, you need to know with a high degree of precision what the original experimenters did in order to know how to do it again. Also, a lot of experiments have results that are extremely specific to the conditions of the experiment, so anyone reading needs to know in what situations the paper's results are applicable and which they are not. Another reason is that the vast majority of papers written will only ever be read by people that are in that field of research. For this reason, they're permitted to be highly technical, as they are functionally technical documents for internal use in that area of study. So using terms like aqueous dielectric objects won't make anyone likely to actually read the paper bat an eye, because they're going to be writing papers that say exactly the same kind of things. Outside of the way that any particular paper handles jargon is that the general population is not scientifically literate. Not even that they don't know a lot about the science, but that they don't know how to interpret the results that science produces. A researcher can look at the abstract and conclusion of a paper and get a decent idea of what was studied in the paper and what the results likely indicate about the subject of interest. But researchers have been trained to think about data and what it indicates and what it refutes. A normal person is going to look at the same paper and try and figure out what it proves as a fact when that's not really how most studies work. Studies look at and record facts, and then analyze what is likely true based on those facts, within a given margin of uncertainty and with the mind of performing future studies to limit this uncertainty or reconfirm using another method. It's not really about what's true. It's about collecting evidence for what we think is true as part of a much larger discussion outside the scope of any one study. And that seems to be what most people don't understand when they get confused about what the literature is saying. Studies don't often produce sweeping truths. They're too specific for that by design. 
So when the public try and read into them looking for this kind of truth, they're looking for something that isn't really there. What we seem to forget a lot is that scientist isn't a kind of person. Scientist is a job you get trained to do. Science does tend to attract a certain kind of person, sure, but that doesn't mean that people that go into science have this natural intuition for rigorous methodology. We get trained to do it. Anyone could get trained to do it, but they aren't. Not because they're dumb or less rational, but because it's not their job. To get the public to listen, it's not enough to be right. You need to convince them to listen. And to do that, you need to have good rhetoric. The literature needs to be formatted in a way that is first correct and accurate, but secondly convincing. And before it can be convincing, it needs to be understandable. And here's the thing. Even two scientists in different fields, even two physicists in the same building, can have difficulty understanding what their colleague is publishing on first blush because it can be so entrenched in the specifics of their area of research. The thing is, there is incentive for researchers to write papers in an overly complicated or misleading way. If you want to get your research financed, you need to find ways to generate lots of interest in it. One way this is sometimes done is by making the research sound much more revelatory than it really is. Uh, drawing conclusions that the data doesn't actually support, but would be much more interesting to potential investors and news outlets. The trouble is that this practice erodes public trust in science, as it makes people wrongly believe that researchers can just make their studies prove whatever they want them to. Just as insidious is the understandable urge for researchers to make their work sound impressive to the grant committees. And with that comes a certain amount of showing off. Digging into the nitty-gritty technical points of your research and your results will make your work sound professional, you sound knowledgeable, and give the material a certain amount of prestige just by presenting it in the right way. The incentives that drive these problems are understandable. If your research doesn't sound impressive, you are not going to get financed, and the science isn't going to happen. In tandem with this, I think it's safe to say that a certain amount of professional pride isn't out of the question. We all want to believe our work is important and worthwhile, so complicated language is a way of asserting competency and justifying to ourselves all the hours of hard work that goes into doing science. But I like to believe that we didn't get into science for the ego. I like to believe that we got into science to advance our sources of knowledge and apply that knowledge in ways that can benefit society. Science doesn't come with a predefined goal beyond expanding knowledge. The decision for how that knowledge is used comes after the fact. But I don't think anyone here honestly thinks that they are the one to make that decision for everyone else. Knowledge is a right that should be made not only available, but accessible to anyone curious enough to go looking for it. And they should be able to examine the primary source of that knowledge and evaluate it for themselves. Because if we think that it is irrelevant if the public can understand the science, that the only people that need to be informed are other scientists, then frankly, those conspiracy theorists are right about us. We are an insular community, indifferent to what the rest of the world is doing. What is the point in us generating all this knowledge if we aren't doing anything to make it easier for people to understand? Outside the scientific community, it's like it wasn't even discovered in the first place. So, how do we do better? Post-secondary education could put more emphasis on how to write clearly and effectively, possibly, de possibly, possibly dedicating some degree requirements to include science communication courses. Similar things are done in journalism courses, so it's not like anyone would need to reinvent the wheel here. Again, it's all about training. When writing papers, some best practices to employ could be to include elements that speak to people new to the subject like a glossary of terms for the more technical content. Information could be presented in a way that better contextualizes what is fair or unfair to conclude based on the results, and where there is room for misinterpretation. It might also be worthwhile to consider including sources to more than just other primary research, but also to secondary sources that can explain the background of your research to newcomers. There is room for scientific journals to improve as well. 
They could do readers the benefit of recommending review papers that give a broader understanding of the topic. That way a new reader can quickly catch up on the important background of the research or use the material as a guide to read along with. Though this will do little good while a large chunk of scientific literature is hidden behind a paywall. Poor communication makes science vulnerable. And as much as I might hate it, and as much as you might hate it, and as much as none of us want to think about it, science is political. Medicine, energy, anthropology, history, psychology, epidemiology, climate, it doesn't remain preserved in the labs and libraries. These things have real consequences to the ways we perceive the world, and so they have consequences to the ways people treat each other. And when the scientists and researchers cannot make the facts understood and available for the public to read for themselves, then that opens the door to people with agendas to make the public believe what they want them to and doubt what the data says. We need to actively take steps that allow the general public to engage with the primary sources of knowledge that are important to them. Because knowledge is for everyone.